So hello everyone, welcome to lecture 2 on molecular representations. So in this lecture, we will talk about molecular representations, how to represent the structure of the molecules, bond line structures. So these are what we call the cardinal structures that we use for organic chemistry. And let us try and identify functional groups. And then we will talk about carbon atoms with formal charges and then identifying lone pairs. Three dimensional structures, how do you understand three dimensional structures. And then in the second lecture, we will talk about resonance and the forms of resonance. So in this lecture, let us focus on the six topics first. So let us start with representing molecules. So there are many ways to represent molecules. So there is Lewis structure, there is partially condensed structure, condensed structure and molecular formula. So what is the information? So understand that whenever we describe a molecule, we want to know what is the information necessary to accurately describe a molecule. So in this means that which representations are easier to draw and which ones give you more information about the molecule. So for example, there are the first common ones are Lewis structure, partially condensed structure, condensed structure and molecular formula. Why do we not use molecular formula? The problem we do not use molecular formula in organic chemistry is because in organic chemistry molecular formula does not have any sense of why, why, why we need to use it. The reason is because take the example of isopropanol, propanol and ethyl methyl ether. All of these molecules have the same number of carbons and the same number of hydrogens and the same number of oxygens. So because all of them have the same structure, there is no sense to the understanding that because the same number of molecules, so using a molecular formula does not represent the diversity in these molecules. You have isopropanol, you have propanol and ethyl methyl ether. All three are different molecules with the same molecular formula. So the reason we do not use molecular formula is because it does not represent isomers. So this is one of the main reasons why we do not use molecular formula. Now the other for common forms of uh, structures is Lewis structure. So it is too impractical to represent it by using Lewis structure is because of the problem that because of the size of the molecule. For example, if you take a large molecule of amoxicillin which is a common antibiotic, right? but condensed formulas would be very little. So we can know very little about its shape and use a condensed formula, but drawing a Lewis structure will make it so large that it makes it incomprehensible. So to make sure that we represent structures that are too complex, so too complex for condensed, sorry, too complex for Lewis, and to let us say you know to uh, to minimal for condensed so or too big to be condensed so we use a special structure called bond line structure or the skeletal structure so what do we know do in a bond line structure? Number one, do not represent carbons or do not write carbons and do not write carbons attached to, the, do not write hydrogens attached to carbon. So these are the main principles that we end up using for representing a bond line structure. So let us talk about the bond line structures. So bond line structures are the benchmark representations for organic chemistry. So once you know how to draw molecules in a bond line structure and how to understand the structure, it will help you throughout the entire organic chemistry, probably in biochemistry as well. How to read these bond line structures? So the first rule is each corner or the end point represents a carbon atom. So whenever you draw a zigzag line, so each corner represents a carbon. For example, there are six carbons in this structure. In the second structure here, we have four carbons. In the third structure here, we have four carbons again. So this zigzag format is fairly accurate for sp3 and sp2 hybridization. So understand that this is sp3 hybridized because all of them are single bonds. Here, two molecules are sp2 hybridized because there are there is a double bond. So what happens in a triple bond? Triple bond has sp hybridization. So sp3 and sp2, you know, are fairly accurate with zigzag structures. 
but sp hybridized molecules are linear so which means you will have to draw a straight line structure so that's why we use linear geometry for sp hybridized atoms and we do not label carbon atoms but we assume that there is a carbon at the every corner at the end point on the zigzag and we also do not draw the hydrogens on the carbon atoms so you must also be able to interpret the bond line structure language to interpret the number and the location of the hydrogen atoms so let's take a simple example of the molecule that's given here so let's take a look at the structure and let's try to understand how many hydrogens are there remember that carbon molecule is tetravalent which means it can form a maximum of four bonds let's take a look at each of these so here this molecule this carbon here has one bond so this is the one bond that it already has which means there are three bonds with hydrogen here again so it has one two three four so it means there are no hydrogens here again there is one two so which means there are two hydrogens here again there is one two so which means there are two hydrogens and here there is one so which means there are three hydrogens now we have to know where the hydrogens are and how are they located so based on the structure that we have we can represent how the hydrogens are in that structure so the first thing we have to do is come to the end carbons so always draw the end carbons first in the end carbon draw a parallel line straight passing so draw a line that passes or the collinear to the original carbon so just extend this line and draw a vertical line perpendicular to the surface and draw a line parallel to this one so parallel to this one which means this goes somewhere so the same thing again one straight one down and then one parallel to the one parallel to this line so this is the structure now once we are done with this the next one we want to do is write down the hydrogen 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 now next look at the end points wherever we draw two hydrogens so at the points where you have two hydrogens remember that it's a v shaped curve so one up one like this hydrogen hydrogen here also hydrogen hydrogen and at this point there's no hydrogen so you can leave it that way so this here is what you are looking at remember that even if you don't draw hydrogens so even if you don't draw hydrogens so remember that this is so remember the presence in your mind so whenever you see a molecule you have to have to remember that this is how the actual hydrogens look in that molecule so to make sure that you understand this so i have given this small example now you can also try some other problems for example try this structures and try to see if you can draw the actual hydrogens on these structures so for you to understand it better i am going to draw the last one so in the last one now let's look at each of these so i told you that whenever there are end carbons all of them are so this is one end carbon 2 3 4 so these are the four end carbons let's try to draw the hydrogens again straight line up so that gives you hydrogen hydrogen and hydrogen again so whenever you see a terminal carbon always remember to write there are three hydrogens there next let's look at the v shaped structures so notice that this carbon has two bonds so it has two hydrogens next this here there are two bonds two hydrogens now let's look at the internal structures so let's look at this carbon here let's look at this carbon this has 1 2 3 and 4 so there's no hydrogens again here 
this carbon has one two three and four done there's no hydrogen for this carbon there's one two and three there's one hydrogen at the bottom now let's look at the next carbon here so this carbon number one two three and four so there's no hydrogens again here one two three and four no hydrogens let's come here so one two and three so which means there is a one hydrogen that is left here let's look at this carbon here so one two three and four so nothing left and if you come here so one two three and four gone so we know that this is the rest of the hydrogens that are left in the structure and these are the hydrogens so remember that even if you don't see hydrogens you have to imagine how the hydrogens are and how many hydrogens are at any particular carbon so once you remember this it helps it e uh, it makes it easier to understand the reactions in organic chemistry so next how to draw bond like structure so we talked about how to read bond like structures let's let's try and draw the bond like structures so if you are given a lewis structure or a pendant structure you must be able to draw the corresponding bond like structure so for that we use a bunch of rules so these rules so let's start with rule 1 so whenever you see an sp2 or an sp3 hybridized atom in a straight chain you should be you should draw it in a zigzag format so for example you see four carbons here so draw four carbons in a zigzag format so the number of lines is one less than the number of carbons for example l is the number of lines then it becomes carbons minus 1 so this is how you can know the number of lines to draw for example if you have four carbons draw three lines 1 2 and 3 if you have five carbons draw four lines so always try to draw start from the bottom and then go up never draw from the top and come down so this is the idea so always try to go up start upward rather than starting from down so let's continue the topic let's talk rule 2 So the rule two is that when you draw double bonds, always draw all the bonds as far apart as possible. Meaning that when you draw a double bond, for example, say double bond oxygen, try to draw it on the upper part of the V, than on the lower part of the V. So this here is much better and always choosable. Next, when drawing single bonds, the direction in which the bonds are drawn is irrelevant. Meaning that if you could draw a general bond, you can draw it as a parallel, or you can draw it vertically. so it doesn't matter because eventually the carbons are still the same the way you draw does not matter next rule 4 all the hetero atoms anything other than carbon and hydrogen so must be drawn and you have to mention all the hydrogen atoms attached to them remember that the hydrogen atoms so are only the ones that you are going to draw are the ones attached to hetero atoms for example you can draw oh so this entire structure even though we do not draw all these hydrogens but we do draw this hydrogen specifically so we do draw this hydrogen the reason is because it's bonded to an oxygen so we only skip hydrogens bonded to carbon so we only skip the ones that are bonded to carbon next rule 5 the cardinal rule is never draw more than four bonds to a carbon atom so always check the valence check the valency of the atom always check the valency of the atom to make sure that you are not drawing more than four bonds for a carbon more than three bonds for nitrogen and more than two bonds for oxygen so this hide this is the idea behind the how to draw the bond line structures so let's take a simple example so here this is the condensed formula so the condensed formula here states that there are two methyl groups attached to a single carbon so these are the two methyl groups that are attached to a single carbon and then you have ch and then ch again so this is c c so this is here this is here and then you get the double bond and then again another carbon but here again you have ch3 taken twice so two carbons the reason we don't have a hydrogen here is because it already has four bonds right so this is on general how you draw bond line structures so when certain arrangement for certain atoms are bonded together in a specific arrangement so they also undergo specific chemical reactions so these characteristic groups of atoms that are bonded are called functional groups so you will have to remember every single one of these functional groups so let's start with the first one where you see a triple bond 
A triple bond it comes under the classification of all kinds. So these are specific class of materials. Next, if you take a long chain carb carbon chain and you add OH to it, that OH is a representation for alcohol. And if there are if there are two chains that are bonded with an oxygen in the center, that represents ether. An example of that is the ethyl ether. If it is in place of OH, if you have SH, it's called thiol. In place of ROR, if you have RSR, this is called a sulfide. Next, if you see, so if you see a ring structure, so this ring with six rings, six rings and three double bonds is called as an aromatic compound or a rarine. So best example of that is mesa methyl benzene. We'll talk about it in uh, uh, general organic chemistry too. And the next one is R. C double bondo, bondo, bond H. So bond COOH is called as a carboxylic acid. Next, if you have R dash C double bondo and X, where X represents a halogen. So remember halogens are basically fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. Then we call that an acyl halide. Remember that acyl comes only when you have an X that is bonded to a carbon which also has a double bonded oxygen. Next, if you have R bond C double bondo bond O bond C double bondo bond R, this is an example of an anhydride. So this is an example of an anhydride. Next, if you have R C double bondo O R dash, this is an example of an ester. In the same way, if you have R C double bondo bond N, then if a nitrogen is connected to any other functional group those are called amides. If there is no double bond and directly can only oxy and nitrogen is connected directly, it's called an amine. So it's called an amine. So let me write it down separately again. So if you have a structure where you see a triple bond, this here is an alkyne. Wherever you see a triple bond, it's an alkyne. Next, if you see a structure with an OH group, this represents an alcohol. Next, if you see a structure that's connected, two structures connected by oxygen, this is an ether. The same structure in place of OH, we have SH, this is called thiol. If you have in place of O, if you have S connected by two chains, this is called as a sulfide. Next, if you have A cyclic structure with three triple bonds, three double bonds. This is called an arene or an aromatic compound. Next, if you have R C O O H, so which generally becomes R C double bond O O H. So this here is called as a carboxylic acid. Next, if you have R C double bond O bond O R dash, this is called an ester. In the same way, if you have R C double bond O EX, this is called an acyl halide. In the same way, if you have R C double bond O EN, and then EN then connected to other groups, so this is called an amide. Next, if you have R that's connected to a nitrogen directly or R dash NH2, so or R dash NH, so R2 dash NH and R dash N. So all these compounds are called amines. So an amide is if you have a C double bond, an amine is when you have a nitrogen that's directly connected. Next. If you have R, C, double bond O, bond O, bond C, double bond O, R, this here is an anhydride. So this is an anhydride. So these are the common functional groups. So these, uh, this is the first slide of functional groups and the second slide of functional groups. And remember that 
whenever you see a specific type of bond, you have to know, you have to remember what type of uh, the compound it is. So understanding that will help you in understanding how uh, the atomic structure also stays. So with that, let's talk about identifying the functional groups. So here you have a beryllium atom that's connected to two hydrogens. So this is an example, classic example of a hydride. So next, let's talk about carbon atoms with formal charges. So, a general carbon atom will generally have four bonds when it does not have a formal charge. So, if it has more than four bonds or less than four bonds and then it will end up having a formal charge. So, when you have a carbon atom that has a positive charge, it is called as a carbocation. So, a carbon positive is called as a carbocation. A carbon negative is called as a carbanion carbanion and a carbocation. So what is the difference between a carbocation and a carbanion? So let us discuss carbanion later. Let us discuss carbocation first. A carbocation contains only three bonds. So that means that there is one hydrogen missing. So because there is one hydrogen missing, so it gets a positive charge. So, when you have less than 4 bonds, the charge is positive. Right? Now, here there is no hydrogen atoms in this carbon, so there is a positive charge here. Here, there is a positive charge, but notice that here, notice this carbon here, so that it has 3 bonds. If it has a positive charge, it means that the hydrogen is missing. Here, you have 2 bonds already which means that there were originally two hydrogens but because there is a positive charge there is only one hydrogen left in the same way at the edge if it is on the end point or the terminal point and notice that it only has one bond which means that there should be three hydrogens but because there is a positive charge there is only two hydrogens on the carbon plus structure next what is a carboanion a carboanion will also have three bonds but the question is in place of a bond extra bond it has a lone pair of electrons so that lone pair of electrons makes it a negatively charged molecule. So this here is an example of negatively charged molecule. So when you have a lone pair of electrons on carbon, so then you get a negative charge. So when you have a lone pair of electrons on the carbon, then you get a negative charge. So this is the difference between a carboanion and a carbocation. Now, so if you remember from the last chapter, we discussed formal charge and we discussed that it affects the stability and the reactivity of the molecules. So here you must be able to identify the formal charge in the bond line representations. So remember that if it is less than the valency, less than the valent valency bonds, then it has a positive charge. If it has more than the valence number of electrons, then it gets a negative charge. For example, let us try and understand how this in this diagram, we have the structures and we will see the number of electrons that they have. Now notice the oxygen first. Oxygen here has, if you remember that, we are only looking for the oxygen share of electrons. So it has 1 here, 2, 3 and it has 4 and 5. Oxygen originally has to have 6, but oxygen here has 5, so it means that it is less than the valency, so it gets a positive charge. Next, in the same way, look at sulfur. Sulfur has total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. So sulfur has a total of 6 electrons here, so which means that sulfur originally is a molecule that has 6 electrons, so there is no charge there. Next look at the oxygen on top, so it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6, so it has 6, it also has 6, so there is no charge, so let me write no, no charge, and hydrogen originally has 1 electron on its valence shell, so it also has 1 electron, so there is no charge. In the same way, carbon here, if, it's, if there is no bond, which means that there is a hydrogen there, so which means that it already has bond, so it, there is no charge. Here also, look at the carbon. So it has 1, 2, so let's look at the number of bonds. It has 1, 2, 3, 
and 4. So there is no charge. Let's look at nitrogen. Nitrogen has 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So it has 5 electrons here. So which means that it has to have, does it need to have any charge? So nitrogen originally is a molecule that should have 5 electrons. So it has 5 electrons. So we don't need to put any charge there. Now let's come back to the next one. So the carbon here. So it has 1, 2 and 3. And there is one left which means that there is an oxygen hydrogen there. So we don't need to count that in the same way here. Next come here. So it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. So it has more than the 6 that oxygen requires. So it means that it has a negative charge. In the same way, let's look at the nitrogen here. So nitrogen has 1, 2, 3 and 4. So it has 4, four electrons but originally it should have 5 electrons. So which means that it's less than the valency. So it gets a positive charge. Now, so let me remove all the dots. So these are all the charges inside the molecule. So if you remove all the ones that do not have the charge, so these are the only three molecules that have the charge. So the first one here is this oxygen here, this oxygen and this nitrogen. Always remember the valency. If it has less than the valency, then you get a positive charge. If it has more than the valency, we had a negative charge. Remember that whenever a molecule is bonded, we only count one electron. So one bond represents only one electron. So that's the reason why the nitrogen here, even though it has two lone pair of electrons, so it has one, two only and three and four and five. So it already satisfies the structure here. So it does not need to have any extra. So that's how we end up with the final and fix the, so we can fix the structure by adding the formal charge. So if you are clear with this, then this would be a great help because everything that comes after this topic will also contain a lot of this understanding of how the formal charge works. So I hope you go back and review this lecture or if you want to just uh, you know review this lecture, I uh, review this part of the lecture again. So just play back the lecture and review this part of the lecture again because this is going to be really important in understanding the concept of resonance. So next, let's look at how to identify lone pairs. So whenever you identify lone pairs, the first thing is formal charge must be drawn always and but drawing the lone pairs is optional because they are often not included. So whenever you see a molecule, it generally depends that they do not represent the lone pairs. How do you know that there is a lone pair or not there? So by knowing the formal charge, the presence or absence of lone pairs can be implied. So one of those examples is to look at oxygen. Oxygen, if it has a negative charge, it means that it has the mo it has more than the valency. Oxygen originally has a valency of 6. If you are putting a negative charge there, it means that it, you are basically saying that it has an extra electron. The extra electron becomes the lone pair of electrons. So originally, uh, oxygen atoms generally have two lone pairs of electrons. So this is a common structure and the two other two are the gonna bond. But if it means that there is only one single bond and there is a negative charge on the oxygen, it always means that it has an extra lone pair. So negative charge, negative formal charge implies an extra lone pair of electrons. So this is the idea behind a negative charge. A positive charge does not represent this. Positive charge and lone pair do not have anything to do with the original structure. So now, how to identify the lone pairs depending on the atom? Oxygen has only three possible bonding patterns, meaning that it can pad so the same three patterns for any second row element with five, six or seven electrons. So if the valence of the total oxygen has 
seven electrons, which means that it has one bond and three lone pairs. That means that there is a negative charge there. So this is the idea behind it. Whenever you see a negative charge, remember that it has one bond and it has three lone pairs. When oxygen has six electrons, it generally has two bonds and two lone pairs, which means that there is no charge. And when oxygen has five valence electrons, that there are generally three bonds and one lone pair. That's the idea where you end up with a positive charge. So an example of this is to look at this atom here. This here represents oxygen having one bond and if it has one bond and a negative charge, note that there are three lone pair of electrons. Here there is only, there are two bonds here. So we can directly write there are no lone pairs. So there will generally be two lone pair of electrons on it. So when the oxygen has a positive charge, it has one lone pair. When oxygen is negative, it has three lone pairs. When oxygen is neutral, it has two lone pairs. So if you want to write it down somewhere so that you don't forget this idea behind oxygen. In the same way, if nitrogen has a negative charge, it means it has two lone pairs. When nitrogen is neutral, it has one lone pair. When nitrogen is neg positive, it has zero lone pairs. So this is the idea behind the lone pairs. And if it is negative, it generally has two bonds. If it is neutral, it generally has three bonds. If it has one lone, if it is posit neg positive, it has four bonds. So remember the idea behind how many lone pairs and how many bonds a particular atom will have depending on the formal charge. Now, how do you represent bond line structures in three dimensions? So all molecules generally take up spaced, take up space in three dimensions. So, but it is difficult to represent that on a 3D molecule on a 2D piece of paper because we are using a paper or a blackboard. So it's not easy to represent that. So what we do is we use dashed lines and solid lines. So dashed represents that it is back into the paper, meaning that it's behind the paper. And when you draw a solid wedge, it represents that it is out of the paper or in front of the paper. So when you see this, it means that it is poking out of the Here, the dash represents that it is piercing in, right? So it means that this is in the back and poking, for, poking out represents that this is in the front. So even everywhere, whenever you see a wedge and a dash, wedge represents that it's poking out in the front and CL, the dash line represents that it's piercing in the back. So this is the idea behind the dashed line. So dashed lines are the way we represent three-dimensional structures on a two-dimensional piece of paper. So there are other ways to represent 3D structures for uh, complex molecules. For example, one of them is Fischer projection. We'll talk more about it in, uh, in at the later courses in stereochemistry, stereo isomerism. And then the other one is Haworth projections and the other projections that are commonly used for bicyclic compounds. So the shape of the compound governs how it interacts biologically. So it is important to accurately depict and interpret 3D bond line structures. So if you're able to understand three-dimensional bond line structures, it helps you understand how a molecule in general can react with any other molecule. 